Well, Kate, thank you so much for coming. It's such an honor to have you here. It's so great to be here. Um, so you are now one of our nation's top experts on climate change. You were previously the senior advisor on climate to Gavin Newsom, and now are the senior advisor to the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm. Um, but you, like me and I'm sure many in the audience, you don't have a traditional background of climate. You're not an environmental engineer or a chemical engineer. You actually studied American studies and then went to law school. So what prompted this foray into climate? Oh, that's such a good question. Well, I think you're... Um First of all, hi, everybody. It's so nice to see some good friends out there. Um, I think your uh, theme of the conference is so apt that sort of every career is a climate career because, you know, I really did come into this um, from an economic development perspective primarily. I had um, a kind of an odd upbringing. I grew up between here, Palo Alto, actually, and Madison, Wisconsin, joint custody agreement, complicated but I moved a lot and I moved between like very, very different kinds of places. And, um, and uh, where we lived in Madison uh, was, there was a big Oscar Mayer factory on that side of town. And a lot of people I went to school with worked, uh, parents worked there. And it ended up getting taken over by craft and then closed down. And the impact of that on those people in that community was really stark. And it just struck me um, then and sort of as I went into college and did American studies, I did urban studies. I ended up getting a planning degree and a law degree at Berkeley. Um, that place really matters. And one of the things about climate change is that it's so place-based. Um, both the physical impacts of climate, so wildfires, right, floods, extreme heat, really specific impacts on specific places, but also the way that different places think about how their economies are gonna adjust to those like pretty dramatic change in the economy that we're looking at. Um, is also really, it's also essentially about economic development. So for me, this has always been a conversation about kind of clean energy industries, climate impacts, and what that looks like in individual places. Um, and so I think there's so many ways into that. I mean, that's a finance conversation, it's an economics conversation, it's a planning conversation, mm -hmm. um, as well as, of course, an environmental conversation. So I really, really do believe that there's just enormously, like, multifarious ways into this, this, this set of issues. Definitely. Yeah, climate change is often seen as a moral issue or a science issue, but when you talk about climate, you usually approach it from an economic issue. Why do you think it's important to kind of make that distinction? I mean, I think it is all those things. It, I guess if there's one thing that I've really come to believe, and I was, you said, I think, Abby said this in my bio, but I was, a, I was an organizer. I was actually a tenant organizer mm. in between law school my, or in between college and law and planning school um, in San Francisco. And being an organizer, kind of the first thing you learn is that you have to start where people are. Yeah. Um, so you go in a room and you're trying to figure out, you have some agenda, right? Like mm -hmm. you're trying to figure out like, how do we get building codes improved in this? How do we organize toward building code improvements? How do we organize toward, you know, uh, against evictions, whatever. But everyone's coming from a different place, from a different story, from a different background from a different kind of core issue. And that's really true in climate work as well. And so I guess I would say that for some people it really truly is a moral issue. Like there's certainly many people who are stellar leaders in the climate movement for whom you, the first thing they'll say, right, is like this is about, this is a moral imperative or this is about my grandchildren or this is about, and for me it's just, I just come from a different place. Like we're mm -hmm. just starting from different places. I really come from, you know, economic opportunity and equity as kind of core, fundamental issues and I just think that you get to that by talking about economic prosperity and I see climate the transition that we're going through which is just huge um, in the economy as one that can create a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. but it also you really do have to be, listen to people when they talk about the fear of that kind of change because it's a big change um, and I think we have to be really open to talking about the fear and about talking about the opportunity so it's I think I think it's kind of like, don't presume you know where people start with this yeah, issue. Definitely. I mean, <laughs> I think you bring up a great point that very few people are actually like climate change deniers. Um, but when you kind of talk about climate specifically, often people's eyes glaze over, you know, <laughs> and they kind of <laughs> look away. What do you think is the most effective way to kind of bring people into the fold? Yeah, it's a good, a good question. I mean, again, I think it's, it's, it's where the most effective way to bring anyone to anything is to listen before you speak, frankly, like is 
where are they, what's keeping them up at night, right? What's exciting to them? When I interview people for jobs, I always ask them, I used to ask them 15 years ago, when you look at the newspaper, what articles do you read? And now I have to say, when you get your news feed, you know, um, <laughs> and you scroll through it. Um, but I think it's kind of illuminating because you're like, you're studying whatever, and you know you're writing your dissertation on something, and then I'm like, but what do you actually read? Like when you're when you're scrolling through your news, like what do you stop on? And people usually have a thing that they yeah. are particularly interested in. It might be education, it might be health, it might be, you know, um, uh, manufacturing, like whatever. It could be, it might be startups. That's usually where they start. People start, and I yeah. think you got to start there. And the great thing about climate as an issue is that everything sort of leads to it. So you can have a conversation about climate with just about everybody yeah. on every issue. Um, I was just in the last month I've been in, I've been touring the oil and gas um, regions. I was in Anchorage and then I was in Bakersfield and then I was in Cheyenne, Wyoming last week. So I've been having a lot of conversations with a lot of people that are yeah. not necessarily like core climate movement people. And um, it's been really inspiring actually. To, to talk to people about kind of where they see opportunity. And every one of those places sees huge opportunity. Definitely. And I think the one thing that kind of unites everyone is that they care a lot about their specific home, like where they live, the, yep. the kind of local effects as you talked about. So given that there's so much variety in terms of the impacts on a very hyper-local level, you know, we have wildfires in California, you have flooding in, in Florida, all these things. How do you think about that when you're advising kind of national level policy with all these very specific hyperlocal effects? It's, I mean, it's, um, I think it's what you have to do, but it's definitely challenging. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the further you are up the, in, you know, federal policy, I'm now removed from state policy. California is a gigantic state, so it was challenging in California too, but um, you really have to be able to think across all of those different impacts and then think about what are policy, how do you design policy that allows for bottom-up engagement, right? How do you design policy that, has, that sets a floor? Because we have to, right? We're, we're embarking on a transition, it has to happen. And uh, it has to happen fairly quickly. Yeah. So, um, so in doing that transition, how do we think about the floor we're setting, which is usually in terms of like, you know, uh, net zero by X date, or, um, you know, we have a goal, we have a goal. And then within the goal, what are the things we want to make sure absolutely happen? So we want to make sure that we, whatever happens, wherever it happens, we're creating um, high quality jobs is, is a huge core value of this administration, right? High quality jobs with equitable access to those jobs because that is how you get economic prosperity in places. We want to make sure that we are paying specific attention to those both who have been leading in the energy economy of the past and are looking at a transition where they might lose everything, if not part of the transition, and those who have been left out of that economy and or have been disproportionately affected by it, right? So there's a real focus in this administration on both what we call energy transition communities, coal primarily, but coal, oil, and gas, and then also on um, you know, Justice 40, the Justice 40 initiative, which says essentially 40% of the benefits of all of our climate and clean energy policy need to accrue to disadvantaged communities, primarily environmental justice communities. Um, you'd be interested that there is overlap between those two communities, it's interesting. But looking at those communities, we sort of have to say, okay, how do we set the floor that we're paying specific attention to diversity, equity, inclusion, to equitable access to jobs, to making sure that the jobs are created are high quality. But then, what we don't want to do is then say, and the job looks like X. Like in your region, you are going to have a one-for-one -one replacement of coal with this other thing that's magically going to replace it and be the same people at the same wages and the same factory doing the same thing. That's almost never going to happen. There's occasional places where you can see that kind of skills overlap. Um, oil rig platforms to offshore wind platforms is an interesting example of that, mm. for instance, where you see a lot of skills overlap and, and manufacturing overlap, but you don't see it a lot. So how do we talk about what that then looks like in each of those places? And it looks really different. I mean, it's in some ways, it's like I always say, it's economic development 101. You gotta start where people are. Start with not only what they want, but also what assets do they bring to the table? Um, and so I think the the challenge, but also kind of the fun thing about doing the policy 
is that it's a lot of different answers in a lot of different places. And frankly, we're incredibly fortunate right this second because we have this infrastructure bill that's a lot of different policies for a lot of different places. Definitely. And so now we're in this great moment where we can actually talk to people, which is what I was doing in Alaska, you know, Bakersfield and in Wyoming, talk to people about opportunity. Um, and, it, and in every one of those places, it was a different conversation. Definitely. So one thing you were just talking about um, and I know it's something that you're passionate about, is this idea of climate justice, mm -hmm. which is based on the idea that the effects and burdens of climate change are disproportionately affecting people of color, working class communities, developing countries. So why do you think that's important to specifically address that when you're making policies, business solutions, et cetera? It's important, uh, it's important for so many reasons. It's important because what we're embarking on is like at the scale of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and I just want to underscore that. Like we are talking about, we have an economy that is the whole industrial economy. If you look at the charts, I, I have a chart in a PowerPoint I do sometimes that has energy consumption from 1776 to now. Um, and it's like wood, 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 and then it's like petroleum. <laughs> it's, you know, coal, petroleum, natural gas, um, and then renewables like slowly creeping up, right? Um, it's totally fascinating, it's, uh, but, it, but it really underscores like, here's the industrial revolution and then all of a sudden it goes like that. Um, and so we built this entire industrial economy that is also the globalized economy, right? The entire global economy on three fuels, essentially, um, with some wood you know, in there and you know, some other things like some, some nuclear, some renewables, some hydro, some geothermal. But those, and those technologies are extractive. Mm -hmm. So we built it around resources that are in specific places, coal seams, oil wells, right? And then they had to be extracted and then refined and then transported and then, you know, liquefied and gasified. And um, it's a very hub and spoke economy. And then the whole electricity economy is also very hub and spoke with like central power plants and, and big transmission lines. And we're talking about changing that entire structure to something where there's like, multiple fuels, some of which are not extracted because they're, you know, the sun and the wind. Um, they don't need to be refined, but, and they, and so most of the jobs end up being in construction for those because you got to build the turbine, but then you just, then you don't have to mine anything anymore. Very, very different. Also far more distributed, far smaller systems, more microgrids, like more, mm -hmm. more um, independent owners. It's just completely different. And we're doing that while we're running an industrial economy. So I just want to underscore what a big deal that is. Um, it's a huge deal. Everybody needs to think about it in everything they do. Um, so one of the things that, that we saw in the last time we did this with the industrial economy is that we did that to a large extent on the back of, of poor countries and poor people. So we did all that extraction and mining um, you know, without necessarily attention to the environmental impacts of those communities. We did a lot of it in countries where we didn't have to pay people as much or at all, right? We did um, a lot of it with a lot of corruption. Um, so there's, there's just a system that was in place that wasn't necessarily done with attention to equity. So that's like, first of all, we gotta deal with that. I mean, there's this, as we're building out what is frankly a new industrial system, the clean energy economy is also an industrial economy. It's a different kind of industrial economy, but it's also industrial. Building that out, we need to pay attention to that, but then we also need to pay more attention to geopolitics because it turns out the world is not actually flat, right? <laughs> I mean, it turns out that, um, that political instability, I mean, all of this is happening right now, but political instability, global trade issues, climate impacts themselves can dramatically affect all those supply chains that we just thought were all you know, frictionless and easy. And so we also have to do this whole new economy paying a lot more attention to what we're producing locally and the impact of how we're producing it locally. So it's all kind of comes back to local supply chains, local manufacturing, thinking about, thinking about standards yeah. and doing those things. And it's just very different. It's a different, it's not just about getting to the lowest cost thing at the biggest scale. Definitely. It's a different set, like a layered set of issues that we didn't pay as much attention to um, the first time. It makes it a lot more complicated, frankly. Yeah. But also, you know, ultimately, the exciting thing is that potentially we actually end up creating, you know, an economy that's creating real middle class jobs and real opportunities and real, you know, equitable impacts. So, exciting. Yeah, I think 
one thing I'm thinking through as, as you've been talking is the fact that often I think that we think of this issue as something that needs to be solved as, at the kind of government level. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're kind of, I think, especially in Silicon Valley, kind of viewing the government in kind of a failing light in some regards with, you know, us going into the Paris Accord and getting out of it or, you know, the Build yeah. Back Better bill kind of being dismantled. So how does business fit in? You know, we're at the business school. You know, if, if we're kind of losing faith in government, how does business fit into that? Uh, most of it has to be done by business. I mean, the government's role is so, con considering what we need to do, I mean, trillions of dollars into this space to, again, create this kind of, this transition and this new economy. Um, we can only do, from the government side, bits and pieces of it. And the stuff that we do well, frankly, is, you know, the stuff we've done well, so, you know, we did it well for oil and gas, frankly. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's early R&D, it's demonstration projects, it's kind of pre-commercial de-risking, like our loan program office does at, at DOE. Um, it's procurement standards so that we create a market for things before there's a really clear market. Um, and then it's a lot of the work around what I just talked about, making sure that it, making sure that it is equitable because there's that isn't built into m many. I mean, it's built in more increasingly, but it's not as built into the private sector as as it is into government. So, I think there's a, there's a role, and there's going to continue to be a role. And every dollar that we put in as government has got to be matched fifty, a hundred, a thousand times Definitely. by the private sector. So it's it's got to be a relationship, right? A partnership. And I think. I really hope we're getting back to a place where that is more of a partnership. I think we've had a number of years of real, of some separation between those two lanes. Um, and, uh, and I think with like environment, social, you know, ESG standards, like um, environment, social governance requirements that a lot, on a lot of boards, I think with the rise of public benefits corporations mm -hmm. as a model, um, the, uh, the whole, all the stuff the SEC is doing to think about climate risk and and disclosure as part of kind of accountability. And then this fascinating, I mean, you know, two years ago there was no market for carbon removal and now all of a sudden there is because of private voluntary commitments to net zero. That's a huge deal. That's like a procurement standard on the private sector side. So it's really, really interesting to see what's happening and I do feel like we're getting more, more alignment. But, um, you know, the thing that we hear all the time from business and it's totally fair is, and you just said it about the Paris Agreement, is the, the consistency issues are really hard. One of the things I really like about the infrastructure bill, which is a climate bill, I'll just say, it's the single biggest investment in clean energy ever in history in this country, it's, um, is that most of those programs are five-year, 10-year programs. And so they're gonna last beyond the political cycles. Um, and those projects will be multi-decadal projects. They'll be in place for a really long time. So it's, that's exciting because it does allow some consistency. Definitely. So, before working in government, you worked on the Risky Business Project mm -hmm. along with Michael Bloomberg and Tom Steyer and Hank Paulson. What were the learnings from that project in terms of how do you get businesses to care? Like, you know, if we're all going to be working, I'm sure we all care about climate change. How do we get the, biz the employers that we're working for to really prioritize this? You're assuming, assuming you're not working for some company that's like making yes. a, a climate product of some yeah. kind. If we're going um, to work for Chevron, if we're going yeah. to work for, you know. Um, <laughs> Which would be fine. I mean, yeah. you know, honestly, if they're as long as as long as they're uh, focusing on diversifying into some of this stuff, um, it, which who knows, but it, um, it's interesting. You know, risky business. The whole point of it was that it was bipartisan. Um, so we had the co-chairs were Tom Steyer, who I was working for at the time, um, who at the time was running Farallon Capital. Actually, he wasn't yet doing Next Gen. Mike Bloomberg, who is, of course, Mike Bloomberg, um, who's an independent, actually, politically. And then Hank Paulson, who's a Republican, former Treasury Secretary. And then we had a kind of a risk committee of a number of mostly former CEOs and a number of other former Treasury Secretaries. Actually, George Schultz was on it, um, mm -hmm. who was just a wonderful person to get to work with. Um, and we focused very narrowly in that project on the physical climate impacts to specific sectors of the economy and regions mm -hmm. of the economy. And we spent a lot of time, we did commodity agriculture and energy demand and coastal real estate. Um, those are the big ones. I can't remember what else we did. Um, health and mortality, but of the big sectors, those were the three. And it, you'd be amazed, actually. Like I, We had conversations with CEOs all over the country. 
And they were really, they were experiencing these impacts because their, their systems, like if you're running an agriculture company, you're extremely climate sensitive, right? Um, and so if I'm Cargill, the head of Cargill at the time, Greg Page, who teaches here, I think sometimes, was on the risk committee. And he was dealing with, you know, the fact that they were seeing suppliers of corn. Corn is very heat sensitive as a crop. And they were seeing that they were having to move for their supplies way farther north. They were starting to buy corn from Manitoba. And they were seeing double cropping, which is shocking, actually, that you could do two crop, corn crops in a year in Manitoba yeah. is shocking. Whereas southern Iowa, where they had been totally dependent, right? The, Iowa is the most dependent state in the country on, on agriculture as tax revenue. Um, was like losing all this all this revenue because their corn crops were incredible were dying um, So they were very sensitive to it And so you'd have a conversation about this very specific thing So instead of coming in and saying do you believe climate change is real? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you'd come in and you'd say so let's talk about heat impacts on corn and let me show you what the science says about the next three decades And like let's talk about what that means and how are you going to incorporate these projections into your thinking and they would start to come around to climate risk analysis as like a central part of of planning, which is kind of amazing because mm. it's it's essentially what the SEC is asking people to do now. So it's um, it's kind of incredible. Another, just one more story on this is that I had a meeting with Idaho Power back when I was doing this, and they're not a very progressive company. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, but their Idaho, um, the power system relies very heavily on hydropower. Um, I think seventy percent of their power in Idaho comes from hydro. And they were seeing, you know, huge variability in hydropower because of just climate change just adds variability to precipitation. You either get flood years or you get drought years. And it was just, they, they didn't have a backup system to manage that load. And we had a whole conversation. They were like, we don't understand what's going on. And I was like, let's talk about the science. Here's, here's what we see. And they ended up coming around to, first of all, they did their first ever adaptation report mm -hmm. um, in, as part of their annual report. And then they came around to thinking about renewables as a backup because renewables are just less climate sensitive than most of the central power options that they were looking at. So it was super interesting. Um, and it just is a different way in, right? I mean, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, it's, it's a way in that's about lived impacts and for them, you know, bottom line stuff, planning. Um, interestingly, much easier to have those conversations with big companies with like really place-based assets, right? Like big manufacturers, big ag, um, just capital investments in places, because those are the hardest things to move and they're the hardest things to manage. Definitely. Um, super interesting. But that project was like um, really an amazing eye-opening thing and it sort of led many of those same people. Mike Bloomberg ended up leading the task force on climate-related financial disclosure for um, the G20. Uh, much of the SEC work now is kind of coming out of a lot of the underlying research on that. Um, so it was a really, it was a really, really interesting experience for me because I am, as we know, not a scientist, <laughs> nor an economist. <laughs> so um, good, also a good reminder that you can actually like you can learn these things yeah. and learn how to talk to people about these things um, if you if you just listen. Definitely. Hi, Kate. Hi. Um, I'm Louise, MBA1. I know Love you. Love your class nice last quarter. You. Great to see you. <laughs> um, my question is around kind of the role. You've worked a lot in state government at the federal level now, and just curious on trying to understand that relationship between the role of like federal government and, and versus like states and how you're working together today, and then also where you can see um, if there's like areas where you know, states could, should play a bigger role or should lead in areas where the like, federal government can't. And just, I guess, understanding that relationship a little bit more, particularly around this topic of you know, place-based communities because each state and each community there is just so unique. Just curious on how you think about those relationships. Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a really important relationship. I mean, with states, with local localities, and with, of course, territories, we have both, uh, and tribal governments. So we all say SLTT, so state, local, tribal, territorial. Um, very different in each of those, but, uh, but in some ways I think the most important thing is that the closer people are to their communities, the more engaged they really are. I mean, you're, you, a lot more of this community level work happens at the local level. Um, there's only so much we can do at the federal level. Like again, we can set the table to allow for that to happen. We can fund, we, we have a lot of the funding that we send out is formula funding out through states actually and local governments. Um, and so we can sort of attach things to that to make sure that it's, it's, it's uh, flowing in a way where there's actually some engagement and bottom-up kind of discussion. But 
a lot of it flows out just through formulas. So we have a, a huge amount of interaction. One of the things that DOE does is the state energy plans. So every state has a state energy plan and a state energy office. Really close relationships with those because ultimately, right, the whole energy system is interconnected. Um, and so every individual state has like a different set of, you know, assets or things it brings to the table. It's super windy in some places. You know, some places are very sunny. Some places have existing hydropower. Some places have, you know, huge opportunity for geothermal, whatever. There's different things in different places. Um, and you kind of bring all that together with, you know, kind of clusters of where there's, like here, where there's a lot of innovation, a lot of patents on clean energy happen here. Um, and we kind of make those connections. But ultimately, that level of economic development of sort of like bringing key businesses to a place, setting up the conditions for that, thinking about tax structures, um, land acquisition is a huge issue for many of these companies, and that's a local issue primarily. The number one thing people talk to us about is siting and permitting um, of these projects. That's a local issue. That's a state issue or a local issue primarily. So the relationship is close. Um, I actually think it's, it's really mutually beneficial. So having come from California, we're kind of famous here for setting really ambitious standards on climate, right? Like, and one of the reasons California can do that and do it in a way that's meaningful is because we have a gigantic market. We have so many people. So when California says we're only selling, you know, like we're not selling internal combustion engine vehicles by after 2035, this state has 26 million vehicles in it. That's a really big deal. Um, to say that because the market is so gigantic. So all the car sellers sort of pay attention when you say that. But at the same time, you need the federal to implement that strategy. There's a whole bunch of pieces that need to be in place to make sure it actually works. We need the charging infrastructure. You need to make sure that there's um, you know, transportation networks that allow for that. Uh, you need to make sure that uh, we are, uh, the whole energy system of, that California uses, which is very regional, it's not just in California, that it's as clean as possible. So that actually has a climate impact that's good, right? All of those pieces, are, many of those pieces are federal um, and require coordination. So I think it's sort of both. It's like we get pushed by states and then you sort of have to fill in the gaps and kind of pull the, pull the threads together and then pr provide the conditions that allow for that to happen. Federal government can also do things at like really big scale. So. Um, you know, we can say, you know, we put, I think we put $11 billion into grid resilience in the, um, in the infrastructure bill, which is significant. And that's going to be really important to California because grid resilience is such a big issue here. Um, and there's only, you know, some pieces of that we have to do because it's over federal land, for instance. So very symbiotic relationship. Um, particularly, though, in the states that are smaller and under-resourced, um, I know I keep talking about Alaska and Wyoming this because I have just been there, so I'm thinking about them a lot. But Alaska only has 700,000 people in it, and Wyoming only has 450,000. So I just just to, to remind you how few people live in these states. <laughs> they are massive exporters of energy, these two states, but that's how many people live there. So if you're in Wyoming, like I was at a conference in Wyoming with 1,000 people. That was a large percent of the population, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> they have two projects coming in, which, to, which between them will create 10,000 jobs. That's huge. But they don't have a huge network or infrastructure of nonprofits, of philanthropy, of you know, civic organizations that are paying attention to all of these pieces on the ground. So in states like that, we actually play a bigger role um, because we're helping to build capacity. We're, you know, we probably spend a little bit more time on the ground in some of those places. Um, just making sure that people have the ability to participate. Definitely. I know it's mind blowing, right? Just think about that. <laughs> yeah, 450,000 people. One more question. <laughs> test, test, okay. Um, hi Kate, I'm Will. I'm a uh, second year MBA going into climate investing. I wanted to pose your question to you and ask you what articles or topics have you most excited or hopeful right now? And what areas do you see like the greatest sources of friction or risk in successfully navigating this transition that maybe need more attention than they're getting today? Yeah, that's, um, I read, you will not be surprised that I read a lot of economics articles. Um, and obviously a lot just about just 
energy is such a geopolitical, it's such a global issue that, that the, the winds of geopolitical change are really important. And so I'm, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about international um, stuff right now, particularly interesting to look at Europe. I mean, it, um, just as everything's very local here in individual communities, how the US, and I would say we're in the same boat kind of as Canada, Australia, these huge countries with a lot of resources that are pretty independent from a resource perspective, um, we are really different from Europe. I mean, Europe is very dependent and uh, their security issues are really tied up with energy in a, in a, in a much more stark kind of immediate way. Um, watching the European kind of reaction to what's going on right now, um, there and just really reacting to threats to energy supplies with a, with a really strong commitment to clean energy, which makes a lot of sense because they're trying to build, because ultimately for them, getting out of this extractive system that's very centralized to something that's more distributed is an energy security issue because you can do it in Europe instead of importing it. I read a lot of that stuff. I think it's, I think it's hopeful actually to see, um, it's, it, it came about because of a lot of things that are really difficult. I mean. Frankly, COVID, the economic shock of COVID to supply chains really underscored supply chain disruption risk for a lot of people. And I think has doubled down the focus on building out new supply chains across the board, particularly in clean energy. And um, geopolitical issues have doubled down on energy security as a, as a real threat. So I'm hopeful about that, even though it's coming about because of really, really terrible, for really difficult reasons. Um, the thing I think that doesn't, and I said this earlier, and I, I say it a lot for those who, who are in my class, um, I think we don't, I think we have been living a little bit of a pipe dream about the clean energy economy as if it magically doesn't have any industrial development. Like, some, I, I do this in class where, you know, you Google clean energy economy and the pictures that come up on Google images are like, a rolling hillside with one wind turbine, you know, like it's like, and I'm always like, so where did the steel come from for that wind turbine? Like where are the power lines? Um, it ultimately, having an economy that's industrialized means you have to build things. And I think it's hard. I mean, I think it's hard to get our heads around because we've exported a lot of that to other countries for a long time um, and to places like kind of sight unseen in various ways. And we're now talking about hard stuff like critical mineral mining. I mean, this is an extractive economy too. It's, it's an extractive economy of different things. We all want to get to a place where that's less true. And um, constantly, we need to constantly be looking at ways to do resource, um, just conservation, honestly, and, and be far less extractive in general. But ultimately, the things we're building that, that declaration of um, not selling any internal combustion vehicles in California, we're gonna triple our energy use in California by 2050 because of that policy and because of electrification policies and all really good policies, but that's a significant increase and a significant number of batteries. So where's that all coming from? How are we thinking about the supply chains? How are we, I think we need to be really upfront about the conversation about what an industrial economy looks like that's a sustainable and, and an equitable industrial economy and not pretend that there, it isn't gonna be industrial because you have to get your head around it at some point. And I think there's opportunity. There's real opportunity in that. There's opportunity for jobs. There's opportunity for new technologies. There's opportunity for innovation, but it is a conversation we have to have. Um, so I wanna see more of that. I think you're starting to see more of that. Um, we're tackling it head on with this administration, which is partly why I went to this administration. But um, I just, I think that's where the conversation has to go for the next decade. Definitely. One thing I loved about your teaching and, and the class was, was how you always pushed us to kind of complexify our views <laughs> on how this transition would happen. You know, I think as students, we're always like, yeah, climate justice, yes, tr you know, sustainable transition, yes, let's just make it happen. You're like, okay, but how? <laughs> let's think through it. So thank you for running on that. I want to I wanna end on, on a more positive note for the entire conference because a lot of this can be very heavy, very doom and gloom. So what for you, kind of along the lines with Will's question, what for you brings you kind of hope for the climate? I mean, honestly, everybody here, I know that sounds super cheesy, but I'm serious. Um, you know, we were saying earlier, uh, our class we've been teaching um, for, I don't know, four years now, and it started as a seminar and it was fairly small and 
you know, and then we went through the Zoom years. And um, but anyway, you know, it started as a seminar, wonderful class, like really tight knit and and um, and intimate. And then last year we had 80 people sign up for it, and it was just exploded. And all of a sudden it was like that seeing students like all of you and others who are coming to this issue from so many perspectives with so many different interests and like it used to be that like 90% of the students that I would see were like environmental sciences students, which is a fantastic thing to be, but it's a very specific group of people or environmental engineers sometimes. And now we're just seeing everybody from all over. Um, so I think it's super exciting. I mean, it really is to me, it's like, it's gonna take that kind of talent and that kind of expertise and that kind of enthusiasm all across the board on all these different issues to, to do this. So I'm super excited about that. Definitely. And we can all go work for Kate at the DOE. <laughs> Come work for me. Okay, please join me in thanking <laughs> Kate Gordon. Thank you so much. Thank you.